to talk about surgical solutions for dislocated IOLs. And at least in my practice in Florida and the US, uh, we have more and more dislocated IOLs that I'm seeing. Here are my financial disclosures, really not relevant to this talk. And some of those reasons are listed here. So it could be, you know, that there's damage to the IOL just during insertion. And sometimes colleagues will say, you know, I'm not interested in doing anything to um, just to exchange lenses. If I have a lens exchange, I'm going to refer that to somebody else. But really, you can't avoid it. Sometimes you put the lens in and it just needs to be taken out immediately. It could be that there's a significant refractive miss and you want to improve the patient's ability to function after surgery. Maybe there's anisometropia from it. There could be intolerable side effects. Certainly, this is a bigger issue with all of the premium lenses and multifocal lenses that we now have available, dysphotopsias, positive or negative, anisometropia, as we mentioned, and then dislocation, which has become a bigger and bigger issue. And I think really there's a significant role for that uh, with eye roving. So we're going to have a po polling question here for the audience. And I just wondered in the audience, what is the most common reason you're exchanging an IOL? Is it for refractive miss, damage to the IOL, intolerable side effects, dysphotopsias? Again, that might be a more premium lens or a diffractive optics situation, sometimes not. Um, or is it a dislocated IOL, either in the bag or, or the IOL itself? And we'll kind of see where everybody's at by all answering this question together. And we'll have that here in a moment. And then we'll kind of look at what we're dealing with. We're all kind of dealing with the same things, aren't we? So we want to make sure our patients are happy. They're able to function the way they need to and dislocated IOLs. So just like my practice, the majority of patients, it's dislocated IOLs. And frequently, that's late in the bag dislocations. So let's see what we can do about that. So oftentimes, these late dislocations are from a zonulopathy. So it might be that they are... Um, sorry, I'm going to move this over. So it could be pseudo exfoliation, uh, could be they've had prior surgery, like a vitrectomy, maybe multiple injections for macular degeneration that can often be a, a cause as well. So trauma, blunt trauma or um, surgical trauma, uh, that can cause all kinds of different problems like UGG syndrome. And you see in that upper right, and I think you can see my cursor here, you can actually see the outline of this single piece hydrophilic acrylic lens as it's rubbing against the iris, causing pigment dispersion, maybe even glaucoma. They may get dysphotopsias, they could have corneal edema and CME, so lots of bad things. Something we have to do uh, or we have to treat in order to get the patient to be able to function better. So when do you exchange? Well, when it's affecting vision. So decrease, decrease visual acuity, decrease quality of vision. If the optics no longer covering the pupil, that's clear, they're not gonna see well. Maybe there's excessive tilt causing increased astigmatism or instability in the refraction. And you could have an increased IOP from pigment dispersion or UGG, and maybe it's just the wrong power and they're not able to function well. So what are the considerations? Well, you wanna look and see first, is the capsular bag intact? Is that gonna be something you're gonna be able to use to fixate another lens or even to put this lens maybe back where it should be? Maybe it wasn't implanted fully within the capsular bag to begin with and you just need to implant it in the capsular bag. What was the length of time since implantation? What's the age of the patient? Do you see evidence of fibrosis? Is it gonna be hard to get the lens out? And what's the lens material and design? Is it something that can be in the sulcus, a single piece acrylic, uh, acrylic lens design with large haptics that are uh, sharp are not good candidates for in the sulcus fixation? And a lot of the same uh, considerations go with an open capsule. However, now you have to deal with vitreous. So you have to think about that. Can you tamponade it? Did the patient already have a vitrectomy? Um, and what, what, are, what additional tools are you going to need? or could need to be considered. You also wanna know what the health history is of the eye. That's going to also affect your approach. So have they had a trap or a tube? And that was a question somebody submitted ahead as well. So we'll should look at a case like that. You can see the upper left is a patient who's had a, a trabeculectomy and has a nice elevated functioning blood there. Have they had a PK? Is there iris pathology that you're gonna to need to deal with with a surgical solution at the time of surgery? And then you're going to look at the preoperative assessment. This is really important for planning purposes during 
during your um, surgery. So what's the ocular health? What does the ocular surface look like? What does the topography look like? Are the endothelial cells compromised or healthy? If you have the ability to look at that, um, even with specular microscopy, just looking with your slit lamp, you can get an idea of the health of the endothelium for planning purposes. If you have access to imaging of the macula, here you can see that this patient here has an epiretinal membrane, some cysts already, increased risk of macular edema. Here, there's some vitreomacular or vitreomacular traction, and again, some swelling and cysts, and that is also affecting their vision, and you want to make patients aware of that. So all of these things can be helpful, but they're not critical in making a plan for the patient. I see just like you do, that there are many in the bag IOL dislocations that are seem to be more frequent in my practice. And I think there's a number of reasons and there is there are some publications on this as well. So eye rubbing, that's a big deal. You can see my father-in-law here is rubbing his eyes. So you can imagine I'm telling him not to, of course. Pseudo exfoliation, this is a big deal for us. We have a lot of patients with that. Um, maybe prior surgery, axial myopia, trauma, and then very aggressive capsular phimosis. This is a patient with retinitis pigmentosa. And so you can see very, very uh, aggressive fibrosis can cause, and phimosis can cause decentration of the IOL. And maybe it was a complication of, the pri of a primary cataract surgery. So eye rubbing, I really think this is a bigger issue than we've ever thought before. Let's talk about how we do it. Having lots of tools in your toolbox is important. One of the tools I like the best is this spatulated cannula. Pretty easy for any manufacturer to make, and these are available in a wide variety of manufacturers. It just has a very tapered tip, which makes it easy to get underneath the anterior capsule and elevate that with a dispersive OVD or viscoelastic. And having lots of dispersive OVD on hand is also important. Iris hooks for good visualization. This spatulated cannula I just talked to you about. Myocol and myostat, if you're going to do something, maybe an iris fixated lens, or maybe you put it in the sulcus, and that would be another reason to need to constrict the pupil. You want to have maybe some triamcinolone. That's really great for identifying vitreous and staining it so that you can be sure you're doing a complete anterior vitrectomy. You want to have maybe 23 gauge, 25 gauge, if available, a small gauge vitrectomy unit. Um, with trocars, I prefer, but not always available. Anterior chamber maintainers are very helpful when you're doing anything that's this much manipulation in the eye. This is one of my favorite things. It's a grease hopper max grip forcep. I think it's called so called a finesse. It has a very fine tip, sort of like this, which is in the duet system by MSD. But these are great for being able to uh, uh, manipulate the eye well in the eye and also for suturing. So grabbing the suture with those makes it much more easy. Disposable retinal lenses, since oftentimes we're worried about retinal pathology, maybe the lens is even already back on the retina. And these interchangeable ends for a forcep and scissors are also a really great system to have. You want to have the appropriate needles. So a 30 gauge thin walled TSK needle is something we get from Japan or 27 gauge long needles, which I'll show you a technique that makes it less necessary to have some of the fancy forceps that we use um, or short needles, which allow for intraocular docking of another needle or the suture. I prefer to use 70, 60, or 50 proline in many of these cases now. Uh, Vortex is a great solution as well. Vicryl can be used. Of course, we worry that these smaller gauge sutures can break over time. And it's another reason I really tell my patients, don't rub your eye after having a dislocated lens that's been sutured. Low temperature handheld cautery allows us to use some of these proline sutures for uh, in a flange technique, which we're going to look at in a little bit. And then intracameral medications, trying to take some of the responsibility away from the patient in their post-operative care. 
So antibiotics, steroids, um, anything we can do to help the patient to function better that way. And then knowing the bag to sulcus um, conversion, uh, Dr. Hill has that on his website. I have it printed in my OR and that allows us uh, to make conversions if we're not able to put it back in the bag, even if we think we can. Let's see, there we go. So a torn or damaged haptic, somebody asked about this, can you leave a damaged haptic? Well, here's a case of a patient who had a toric lens implanted and you can see that the minute it got in the eye, already the haptic was disinserted from the optic and this had to be removed. So no question has to be removed. Sometimes with a three-piece lens, if there's deformation of one of the haptics, typically the trailing haptic, you can actually reform that. And if it hasn't been too damaged, uh, actually use the lens and still have it center. And in a situation where you might not have a backup lens, you could even do an optic capture, a reverse or primary optic capture in order to center the lens. So we're gonna talk about uh, techniques for eye well removal in just a little bit. I see there's a question there, um, but I'll show you some techniques in just a moment. So this is a lens that also had to be removed. You can see it's a toric lens as well, a premium lens, but it had a scratch right in the center of the optic. And so better to remove this lens now than have the patient complaining of dyspotopsias postoperatively, where you actually have to worry about, um, you know, explanting once there's been fibrosis. So here's a technique. I, I generally do like these scissors. These are the McCool forceps. I don't know which manufacturer makes them, um, but they have like a little gripping surface on the very end of it. You can see it's almost like a gripping forcep. And then they're very heavy. So they'll go through some really tough lenses. Um, and then you can use them as a forcep there to remove the two halves. So I, that's my tends to be my go-to method, uh, but there, there are others. And I think this is gonna show you a different one. So here, what we see is I'm using that spatulated cannula on a dispersive viscoelastic. I'm inflating between the, underneath the anterior capsular leaflet along the axis first of the optic haptic junction. And then even everywhere I can to try to make sure that there's some uh, viscoelastic behind the optic. But here's the first area of concern with these lenses. You get a constriction of fibrotic ring anywhere there's an, an enlargement of the haptic. So this actually, even though it's an Acrosoft platform, it does enlarge uh, more proximal to the optic even. And that ring can be uh, removed. I'm now removing a little fibrotic ring from around the terminal bulb. Uh, but those can be removed by either using a second instrument like I am here, or I'm also inflating along that axis and using the spatulated end of the cannula to, to gently remove that ring from where there is that terminal bulb and that enlargement there along the axis or, or along the uh, width of the um, eye well. And I guess this one I am also cutting with the same uh, McCool forceps, grabbing with the end of it. I like to already have one of the haptics out so you're not bending that, potentially um, impacting the iris and causing a bleeding or a tear. And in this case, I was able to put another lens immediately right back into the same location. Here's another technique. Um, and this is a modifi modification of a technique that I also use, especially in a warm lens. So a lens that's already been in the body. Um, but you can take a lens, any of these lenses, and you can actually just twist your arm after you've grabbed at least two thirds of the way across the optic and you can twist it and bring it out. In this modification, by putting a cannula there through a paracentesis, you're actually protecting the endothelium as well. So that's another little twist on the twist and out technique. So in the most common things that we see in the US, uh, these two platforms, the Technus and the Acrosoft or now Clarion platform, we already talked about the areas of problem, which are either this little dilation uh, on the Acrosoft or the terminal bulb more typically. And in this 
particular design, there's this angulated expansion close to the optic, and that tends to be where there's fibrosis. But all lens designs have their more typical spot. So here again, this is a restore, I believe, that was being uh, explanted. And you can see that, yeah, it's pretty stuck in there. So the other thing you want to be careful to do is use lots of viscoelastic, go slowly, because pulling on the capsular bag, those areas of fibrosis can cause a big zonulopathy, which is not what you want as you're trying to decide how you're going to fixate the lens that you're replacing this lens with. So slow, deliberate movements, lots of viscoelastic. Here again, there's that fibrotic ring that's near the expanded portion in the middle of the haptic. And by coming from another direction, using more viscoelastic in that region, using maybe that spatulated end, I'll be able to expand it, maybe break through the fibrosis. Um, and that will allow me to more safely remove the haptic without causing zonulopathy over there. So you can see just by, by putting some viscoelastic in that area, it allowed me to get that. And now there's this little constriction at the terminal bulb. And I'm going to do something very similar to remove that there. And this works for whatever the lens design is, thinking in the same manner that by expanding those areas of fibrosis, you can um, alleviate that and you can have a result that doesn't isn't as impactful on the zonules. So this is an example of the, the other type, the technus multifocal, where that constriction is right here. You can definitely see that fibrosis. We know it going into the surgery. And we're going to spend a lot of time just trying to free that up. Uh, again, similar sort of considerations as before. I'm going to speed it up just a little bit because we have a lot of videos to look at. And here, although it looked like there was a big constriction there, it did actually free up pretty readily. This side, I think we're going to see it was a little tougher. And your other option, rather than causing damage there, is to just take some intraocular forceps and disinsert the haptic from the optic. And sometimes that's the best thing to do. So in this case, again, the same technique of sort of blowing out uh, viscoelastic in the air, the constriction allowed this to free up and come out more readily. And a lot of, we're going to look a little bit, this is one where it was more difficult. I really just couldn't get it to free up in this axis. And in the end, it just seemed that it would be easier to disinsert it there. And then sometimes you even have the option of backing it out the other way at that point. So that, that can be the, the, the safest way. So here's a case where, well, it was a complete in the bag dislocation. You can see, it looks like it may, might be a three piece lens in this case. I'm putting in that trocar that we mentioned. It's a 23 gauge trocar with valves in this case. And I put the infusion trocar there in first, you can see, and here is the one for the vitrector. You always wanna visualize the end of the trocar in the pupil to make sure that there's no entrapped tissue Sometimes it can entrap tissue even in the ciliary body and get buried there. So you want to be sure that that end of the trocar is visible before you remove it. I've done an extensive vitrectomy, not shown here, of course, uh, for time, but then elevating the whole IOL bag complex in front of the iris, more vitrectomy because we just don't want to pull on vitreous if we can avoid it. Using those same uh, lens cutting forceps, which I do twist it out sometimes as well, but oftentimes this way. When you take out the lens, you'll see sometimes a summering ring cataract is left behind is at risk for falling in the back of the eye. So be aware of that and try to avoid that, of course. And then uh, we're coming up with a solution to put a new lens in once the whole uh, lens bag complex is gone. So when you had now, like this case I just showed you, have an aphagic patient, what is your favorite or go-to choice? So this is going to be an audience response as well. Uh, is it anterior chamber lens? Is it a posterior chamber lens? And then we have lots of choices because you could do an intrascleral haptic fixation like the Yamani technique or a flanged technique. We'll talk about that later. Or you could glue the haptics um, like in the agarwal technique that's been uh, used frequently. Or do you take a three-piece uh, IOL and fixate it to the iris? 
do you use a, do you suture the eyelet of a closed loop or an eyelet containing haptic lens like the CZ 70 BD used to be and there are many designs like that uh, internationally and that could be with Vortex or proline or do you use the iris claw lens which we do not use in the US there were a lot of questions about that but I have no experience with the iris claw lens we don't have it available in APIC powers in the US and looks like a lot of people are doing an intraskeletal haptic fixation, which has been such a great um, technique. I'm super happy to have, you know, that in my career, been able to pivot to more of a Yamani technique and using the principles of flanged IOLs, we've been able to do other things that sort of are less invasive. And we're going to talk a bit about that. Some of you may know those techniques already, and we'll cover that uh, here as well. So we're gonna move on. Let's see, we'll close that. And so traditional methods, we kind of talked about those, right? You could fixate the IOL bag complex with nitoproline. Problem with that is that nitoproline tends to break over time. And I really feel like this is an increased problem, again, in patients who rub their eyes. So I am spending much more time, no matter what the technique is, talking to patients about not rubbing their eyes. And uh, then even if they don't, the knot can erode through conjunctiva if it's not buried well, and that can create problems. The same is true as if you use Gore-Tex suture. So Gore-Tex won't fail over time, but I've definitely seen Gore-Tex that's eroded through conjunctiva before. And you know that can have a lot of the same issues. Uh, and you have to take down the conjunctiva unless you do a Hoffman pocket. So other issues with Gore-Tex um, as well, maybe not as, as readily available in some areas. The, um, but oftentimes it requires in the past an exchange of the IOL. That would require an, a vitrectomy. There could be the loss of cortical material or summering and cataract into the posterior segment. Removing the lens can be traumatic. It can cause damage to the iris. You might lose the lens into the posterior segment. You can have corneal damage as well. And it does require a second IOL. And that's another expense, and especially disappointing to patients who have premium IOLs as their primary lens. Intrascleral haptic fixation, a lot of you are doing this, and that's been really nice because we don't have to disturb the conjunctiva if you use the Yamani technique, or if you glue it, uh, it may allow you to keep, especially a three-piece lens that's already in the eye. But if it's not a three-piece lens, it can require a new lens, and it can be technically de demanding, especially I find the Blue to IOL can be a demanding technique as well. So um, here we're going to go over the Yamani technique just a little bit because it's become so popular and many of you are using it. As you know, it was popularized by Shin Yamani in Japan. It, it typically utilizes that thin walled TS, TSK needle that we talked about that's 30 gauge, keeping the perforation very small. Um, you make an intrascleral tunnel two millimeters posterior to the limbus in the orientation of the haptic as shown on the right and use a three-piece IOL. The three-piece IOL, it can be a variety of different um, styles, but the material of the haptic is what's so important. And you really do wanna try if you're using a new design, the handheld cautery to see what the flange will look like prior to actually putting it in the eye. Um, the needles after the haptics are are introduced into the needles that are withdrawn and low temperature handheld cautery is used to create a flange that is buried into the sclera. The advantages are it's minimally invasive. It's a small incision procedure and it fixates the IOL to the sclera when a bag is not present. We find that the CT Lucia lens works best because it has these very, um, P the PVDF haptics are very resistant to kinking and there can be some manipulation that's required in order to um, thread that. And here's a video. This is actually by Brandon Ayers at Wills and uh, just nicely uh, demonstrates the technique. In this case, he likes to put the lens in the eye, um, the leading haptic in the eye and the optic. And you can see putting that bent TSK needle two millimeters posterior to the limbus, creating about a two millimeter tunnel in the orientation of the haptic before entering in the eye. Once you've entered, then you turn the needle so you can visualize it in the pupil. And the other thing to notice is that he's 
done a vitrectomy. There's some trocars. He also has an AC maintainer in to maintain pressure. He's using micro forceps and the pupil's pretty small. Didn't really have to dilate the pupil in order to do this technique. Of course, the bigger the pupil, always, I think, a little bit easier, but also prevents the IOL from falling posteriorly if it's small enough. Once the first haptic is threaded into the needle, you can allow that to just sit there. Putting the next needle in, again, a two millimeter tunnel in the direction of the haptic. So I always think about which way does the haptic go. And then you're going to manipulate the optic so that you can see the end of the haptic and then carefully thread that into the needles with really threading it far enough because the most disappointing thing I find with this technique is if you withdraw the needle and the haptic's not there. So I try to get you know as much as I can into the needle. You can do either withdraw them simultaneously or sequentially as you see here. And then creating a very small flange does not need to be big. And that's gonna be the theme of all these flange techniques. And then you really wanna make sure that you're using something small. Usually I use the end of my utratas because they have a small point and bury that into the superficial layers of the sclera. So nice demonstration of the Yamani technique here. So what are alternatives to exchange? So sometimes you just don't wanna exchange it. I'm just looking at questions here. How do you manage the cell ring ring in the case of an IOL exchange? We did this one. Um, so in the case of an IOL exchange, yeah, you're kind of dealing with that like a cataract in a lot of ways. Um, a lot of times I'll either, if we were doing the belt loop technique, which I'm going to show you in a minute, it's an advantage to have it there. Uh, but if I'm removing the lens itself and the bag and the cell ring ring, you know, you're, you're dealing with it like a a cataract in some instances, it's as thick and dense as one. You have to, I typically elevate it into the interchamber and you may have to use other instruments, even scissors to try to cut through it and break it into smaller pieces. So the three piece lens options are rotated into the sulcus. Um, that sometimes is okay if there's sufficient capsule or support. You can even do that with an optic capture. The Yamani technique, as we just showed, glued intrascleral haptic fixation, iris fixation, scleral fixation, or an in-the-bag belt loop with the double flange technique that is on the right, actually. So Yamani is on the lower left there, another example of that. Single piece, you don't have so many options. You can't leave it in the sulcus. You could do a scleral suture uh, with vortex even, or I prefer this in-the-bag belt loop technique, which I'm going to show you in a little bit. And then sometimes there's the option of a piggyback lens if you're looking at a refractive exchange. So flange techniques have had an evolution. And really the beginning of them was the Yamani technique that we've already talked about. I wanted to show you this little variation. This is really how I do it. I like to keep it in the inserter and then directly put it into the lumen and the needle from the inserter. I find that that's a little more stable. And then of course the trailing one is the one that's always a little bit more difficult. And then you wanna um, externalize these. You can do a little adjustment by trimming one end or the other in order to get better centration. So that's another option that helps you fine tune the result. But we already saw that. So another double flange technique is to fixate the IOL through an eyelet. And that was actually how Sergio Canabrava who started using segments of proline surge suture, that was his first uh, contribution, was looking at an eyelet fixation with the lens that came with an eyelet to begin with. I think it was a CZ70BD. And here's another way of looking at that with the closed loop haptics of the AO60 60 or Acrios by Bausch and Lam. There is in under development in India in a couple of different places, development of specific lenses for proline suture fixation with two eyelids, so you can avoid tilt, um, but that is one way. And that would be in the case of an IOL exchange rather than keeping the lens. I have developed this technique, the belt loop technique for in the bag dislocations. And we're gonna talk about this a little bit. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you a couple of videos. So, you know, don't be too uh, worried about looking at this right now um, because we'll go over it step-by-step. Step. But essentially you're taking a proline suture segment, making flanges on either side, going through the capsular bag, back out through conjunctiva and sclera 
and just using the lens that's already there. And we'll talk about why that might be good. Another way is to actually create an, a fenestration within an IOL that's already in the eye by using a, a punch. This is a punch developed by Morgan Micheletti from Texas and is through Diamatrix. Or you could even just take the needle itself and pass it through the IOL. It tends to cause more damage to the IOL, a little bit of a stellate pass. It would depend on if you have a cutting needle or a tapered needle too. So I'm looking at needle solutions for that technique as well. Sometimes you can uh, elongate the haptic or just pierce the, um, the actually the haptic itself with a needle and put proline in there. You have to be very symmetric in how you enter the haptic and where on the haptic you're doing this pass in order to get good centration with this technique. And then this is an interesting thought as well, where you're creating a sort of a little round button of the proline suture and a fenestration there, and then putting the haptic through it, creating a flange and using that as a longer haptic. So interesting innovations in this area. Let's talk about the belt loop technique though. Um, that is actually, thank you, uh, something that I've developed and it was all based on this flange technique. It uses typically for me now, 6-0 proline. Um, that allows you, and I'm gonna just move this aside so we can see, but that allows you to have a 30 gauge TSK needle, a very small per perforation, only uses handheld cautery. And you could use intraocular forceps and do it intraocularly, but you can also do it extraocularly with regular forceps. So I think this is about as low technology as you can get for fixation of a dislocated in the bag IOL. And it's appropriate for every type of IOL, every kind of design I've done this, this technique with, and often avoids anterior vitrectomies, which I think is great for the patient. So here's a case, somebody asked me about, what do you do if you, you have a trabeculectomy, what would be your solution? So here's somebody, nice elevated functioning trab, and they had a toric IOL. They had a toric IOL, which was nice to want to keep it, but beyond that, I didn't want to disturb the bleb or the conjunctiva unnecessarily. So I've marked 180 degrees apart in the axis of the toric, and I'm bending that TSK needle with the bevel up, and I'm placing it two millimeters posterior to the limbus through conjunctiva and sclera, and I'm going to place it through the capsular bag right between the haptic and the optic at the area of the haptic-optic junction. And in these cases, fibrosis of the bag is actually beneficial. It helps keep this proline suture from sliding. And now I am using intraocular forceps to thread this 30 gauge needle with the 6-0 proline suture, cut it a bevel. Once it's externalized, I grab it and create kind of a large flange. I call it a safety flange. It's just there so I don't pull it out because nothing's worse than pulling out a suture you already placed, right? So now I'm inflating the sulcus bending another 30 gauge TSK needle, placing the other end of the same piece of proline suture into the entrance chamber that's been cut at a bevel, and now making sure that this needle goes in front of the haptic and the bag and the optic. So it's purely in the sulcus now. And I'm taking that other end, threading it into the lumen of the needle so that now it's creating a loop, a loop through the caps or bag at the optic haptic junction in the axis that I want it to be for this toric IOL. And then I'm going to snug that up a little bit, not all the way yet, because I'm going to place a similar belt loop 180 degrees on the other side because this had generalized zonulopathy. And this is gonna allow me to very finely tune centration of this lens and the orientation, because now it's in the orientation that I want it to be for their, um, for their uh, toric lens. This is now putting the second pass, the second half of that first piece of, or the second piece of proline suture, creating the second belt loop from behind the optic, through the capsule bag, and now around through the sulcus and back out through conjunctiva and sclera. Now you can see in the beginning, it looks like this is gonna be decentered, but it's because this loop actually flipped around. It flipped sort of the wrong way. And so I just pushed in some more of the proline suture so that I can grab it 
and then flip it the proper way. And now centration can happen the way it should. Very small flanges are all that's needed. You can just, as soon as you create just a little bit of elevation and then, or expansion, and then you really wanna be able to bury these within the superficial layers of the sclera. Because the biggest risk with this technique, and then I can see I'm using the utratus to bury that in. The biggest risk is really that you may get erosion over time. And I have seen it happen once. It was an earlier case where I made a large flange and did not bury it sufficiently. I was kind of doing this jiggle test. It makes me feel good about the, the how strongly it's fixated. But uh, you can see that this avoided disturbing this nicely functioning bleb and allowed the patient to keep the lens they wanted. And that really, I think, was a benefit to them. And we're getting a little bit further in our talk. So I'm going to go more quickly here. Just wanted to show you another example. This again is a bilateral, a double belt loop, I call it. See at what a taper this was cut at. That is really facilitates your ability to put it into the uh, lumen of the needle. Again, trying to be close to the optic haptic junction. So variations on this are you can take a longer needle, like a 27 gauge needle, you can use even 5.0 proline and place the needle all the way across through a paracentesis and then load that externally. It's easier if you don't, especially if you don't have really good quality intraocular forceps. So loading it externally, definitely an option. You can even preload. And again, there's that safety flange, very large. You can preload the suture into the lumen of the needle and then push it forward as well. So a couple of different ways of doing it. I tend to load intraocularly though. I'm gonna go past that because there's a few other things I wanna point out. So this is a case of extreme phimosis. This patient also has a CTR. Somebody asked, what about having a CTR in the eye? Just leave it. That's another thing that the loop is going around and helps to stabilize it. So this patient had CTRs, I think it was a retinitis pigmentosa potentially patient, but obviously had very aggressive fibrosis and phimosis. See the CTR right there. Uh, you can see it. It's in the periphery here. There's the CTR. But what I'm doing is I'm going through the closed loop haptic, and now I'm externalizing it outside of a paracentesis and loading the suture externally. And that I think, you know, especially I've done this on mission trips where I don't have all my fancy equipment. And that definitely makes it a more straightforward procedure. So I'm not going to show you the rest of this because I do want to move on to tell you, if you want to take a picture of this, these are step-by-step -step instructions of what to do for the belt loop. So you, you mark posteriorly uh, two millimeters from the limbus, 180 degrees apart. Use that 30 gauge TSK needle if you're using 6-0 proline. Pass it through the conjunctiva and sclera behind the, the optic through the capsule bag and then through the, uh, the sulcus, and then create these small flanges that it's very important you, you bury. And if you look to the right here, you'll see that there's a video of an extruded. That's the one I was telling you about, that it's a large flange. See, that's way too big. And it, it did erode through conjunctiva. And what I did is go back to the OR, trimmed it, melted a small flange, buried it appropriately. Now you can see it's a tiny little dot buried in the um, superficial sclera, and this patient did really well. But we want to avoid the risk of endophthalmitis. So where would you want to avoid an IOL exchange? Well, cases like I showed you, maybe they had a premium lens. Maybe it's a difficult to remove lens. You have to make a large incision. It's a PMMA lens. You want to avoid the conjunctiva. So maybe a trabeculectomy or a tube that's working well. Maybe they had a lot of surgery, a vitrectomy, or a buckle, and you don't want to get into the conjunctiva or it's very scarred, and to avoid an anterior vitrectomy, of course, as well. So here's the potential complication, though there are definitely are case studies showing endophthalmitis after this procedure, and you don't want to do, you want, don't want to risk that with patients and talk about um, eye rubbing. So last polling question. In the setting of a dislocated bag lens complex, like what we've been talking about, in what settings would you most often consider suturing the current lens rather than exchanging the lens? So would it be conjunctival scarring from prior surgery, like we talked about, prior to or tube shunt, 
maybe they have a dislocated premium lens or it's difficult to remove the lens. And I know you may not know, but just in your practice, what do you envision if you're not doing this already uh, would be the major number reason, you know, what would be the patient circumstances where you would consider this technique? And for me, it's really all of those things. And just in general, I like avoiding an anterior vitrectomy. I think that it, it avoids some of the complications that can happen with that, with removing the lens and with vitrectomy. Uh, but, you know, there are settings that we find most often. So difficult to remove lenses. Yeah, I think that that's a big one too. It depends on what area you live in and what the primary lens that's been implanted is. So if you primarily in your region have PMMA lenses or plate haptic lenses, I would, this is another reason why I would look for any reason or any method for retaining that lens instead of having to exchange it. So let's see. So, and this is the conclusion. So pre-operative planning pearls, make sure you have lots of options. I always have three lens choices and three plans available. Plan A, plan B, plan C. And I tell the patient, my primary goal is going to be to do the least invasive thing possible. If we can retain the lens you have, that's what I want to do. Um, but I'll have backup plans as well. And I really won't know exactly what's going to happen until I'm in your eye. Practice techniques if they're new prior to the day of surgery. There are lots of eye models out there, or if you can get donated eyes or pig eyes, but practice any way you can so that you're not as nervous or challenged on the day of surgery. Review videos. There's tons of videos online. I'm going to have some links to YouTube videos from the belt loop right after this slide. Um, have plenty of supplies on hand. So sometimes I'll think, well, you know, I'm going to do this technique and we'll have this suture or this particular disposable available. Make sure that your staff know you need it and that they're not on back order and that they've ordered them already. And review your whole plan with your team so they know what you're doing. I often have them look at a video with me as well if I'm trying something new and tell them exactly what I'm trying to achieve. And then video your own cases if possible. Even with smartphones, we can, we can video our cases and look at them and try to refine uh, techniques. So that's this, I'm gonna give you the slide actually. Um, let me close this for a second. I'm gonna show that slide that I was telling you that has the, the links. So here it is. And let me look and see if I can answer some of these questions. So what technique for eyewall removal? We talked about that. Summer ring, we did act, talk about that as well. Um, is there a contraindication of strabismus surgery in patients with scleral fixated IOLs? No, but I would definitely talk if you're the, the, um, the surgeon, of course, you know what the issues are. If you're referring to somebody else, I would definitely tell them where the suture is, what to look for. Is it a flange? Is it Gore-Tex suture? Is it um, proline suture? And I would, you know, let them know that they may want to avoid that area if possible. But generally speaking, we're not suturing at three and nine o'clock. And that's generally where strabismus surgery is taking place. So not, not an issue usually. Do I recommend a Yamani technique for refixation of a PMMA three-piece IOL? Again, just, it just matters what the haptics are made of. And so haptics of PMMA lens is, are typically not PMMA. I, I don't really know the answer to this question, but whatever lens you're trying to use for a three-piece, and we have several in the US, they, many of them do make flanges. The flange looks different depending on the haptic material. So sometimes it looks more tapered and I could show you a picture. It'll be hard for me to get to right now, but sometimes it looks tapered and be aware of that, make a larger flange. And sometimes it looks more like a button. And that material is really the best for creating uh, a flange for Yamani technique. So practice, look at the what happens when you use cautery on the lens you intend to use. So what situation do you prefer mechanical? So I, I really use the iris fixation as my backup. Sometimes it's plan B. So if I try a Yamani um, surgery and for whatever reason, it's my lens is tilting, I'm having difficulty with centration, 
uh, just, you know, maybe it was a long day and it's just a tough case or whatever it is. That's my backup. And so I will put an iris fixated lens. There's a double uh, needle technique for that that was popularized by uh, a surgeon, John Hart. If you look on YouTube for double needle iris fixation with John Hart, you will see this technique. And by placing one of the needles primarily, and then going back and placing a second needle, you can actually make a more, a smaller bite of the iris more peripherally. And you'll avoid that cat eye appearance that happens when the suture is too close to the optic. So that is a subject of another talk, but, uh, but the videos that are on YouTube are really helpful and that works well. And of course you want to use 90 proline uh, or, you know, you can use 10 proline too, but you're at risk of breakage. And the cases I see that have breakage are typically iris fixated lenses. Uh, please give more details on haptic elongation technique. So this is not a technique that I've used, uh, but what you do is you create a large flange, take a, a flat ended forcep, squish that into a round circle, take a 30 gauge needle and make a perforation in the middle of that squished circle, and then put the haptic through that and make a flange that will stop it from being pulled through that squished circle. So if you if you Google haptic elongation, you'll find that. I haven't used it, but I have some ideas of how it could be really helpful. So uh, regarding belt loop, have you encountered sutures slipping around the haptic? I have not post-operatively, but intraoperatively. So if you pull one side too tight to begin with, it will stretch out, especially a, a single piece acrylic lens it'll stretch that haptic straighter. And if there was not a lot of fibrosis around the optic or around the haptic, it can slip off. So early in my experience with the belt loop, I did do that uh, once. And so be careful there. What I do now is I don't tighten one side or the other. Once I put one belt loop, it's not tight at all. And then I slowly uh, externalize more and more suture on either side, balancing the two sides watching the lens come more anterior to a normal position behind the iris. The typical thing you'll do is not bring out enough suture because it's a different feel. It feels like it's tight when it's not, but if you go very slowly, you'll get it up there where you need it uh, without pulling one side too tight and decentering the lens and elongating the haptic. That's when that'll happen. Uh, exposed suture eroding the conj in a scleral sutured IOL or Yamani. So what I would do is what I showed in that last slide, which is just go back to the OR, um, externalize a little bit more of the suture, cut the end, make a smaller uh, um, flange and rebury it. If it's a scleral sutured IOL with Gore-Tex, that's happened as well. And sometimes if the way the technique I would typically use with Gore-Tex involves making a sclerotomy and you can just bury it better into a sclerotomy, um, or you can create a small um, pocket to push it up into in the scleral, but that always involves taking down conjunctiva. With the Yamani fixated or a flange, you don't have to take down the conjunctiva. And let's see, which of these is easiest learning curve? Uh, I like the belt loop. I think it's pretty accessible. I think it's actually probably more accessible than anything else, especially if you externalize the end of the needle through a paracentesis. That stabilizes the eye. You can use any forceps to introduce the, the, um, the proline suture and it's pretty straightforward. That's what I think. Uh, nylon nino, in, in case you don't have proline, the problem with nylon is it breaks. It degrades much sooner than proline. That's why we use it. But if all you have is nylon, then that's what you have to use, unfortunately. Um, mask it basket. I, I love that. I First of all, I just like the name. And Sam Maskett's a great guy. And I love Nicole Fram and really cool thing. I actually haven't used it. Um, because generally I grab it with the interactive forceps and bring it anteriorly, but it is a great safety neck. And I, I think it's, it's a nice technique to know about. 
Um, there'll be a case I'm sure someday in the future where this will be the right thing for me, but I, I haven't used it. Uh, scleral puncture for the belt loop. So now what I do is I mark two millimeters posterior to the limbus and the first pass, the one that goes posterior and through the capsular bag, I put just posterior to the two millimeter mark. And then the second pass, which is the one through the sulcus anterior to the, the IOL, I'll place just anterior to the, um, to the two millimeter mark. So they end up being about a half millimeter apart on either side of the two millimeter mark posterior to the limbus. Um, do I prefer Yamani? I do, um, just because I don't have to take down conjunctiva. So I think the glued IOL technique is great. Some people, um, well, a lot of people have a lot of experience doing it and do it very, you know, it's very slick. It can really be used with most haptics that are three-piece IOLs. Um, I have done a bunch of them, but once Yamani came along, I, I actually have mostly done Yamani technique or belt loop. My experience with the retrofixated iris claw lens, I, we don't have access to it in aphakic models or aphakic powers here. And it's not really used as a phakic IOL much either. So I have no experience. I would like to have experience, um, but, but we don't have access to it. So I would learn from all of you. Thanks for, for joining me.